Hello, this is Jamie Green, editor of Investment Advisor Magazine and thinkadvisor.com, uh, speaking to you from the IMCA annual conference in Boston. I'm pleased and honored to have Alan Blinder with me today. Um, uh, Professor Blinder is long taught at Princeton in the great state of New Jersey, uh, but uh, he also spent quality time in Washington as vice chairman of the Federal Reserve and on uh, President Clinton's Council of Economic Advisors. So I hope thanks it was quality for, time. Well, <laughs> Thank I you. hope so too. Uh, thanks for taking the time. Sure. I appreciate it. Uh, in your keynote speech, you spoke about um, what the likelihood is of tapering, mm -hmm. taking, uh, finishing up by the end of the year, October or December yeah. of 2014. Very, very uh, high. Very high. And, and what comes after that, I guess? Well, that is the question. So my belief is that what comes after it and the hawks on the committee won't be that happy with this is nothing for a while, uh -huh. not forever. Fed's got a lot of exiting to do, but I expect that after the taper ends, which only means, remember, that the Fed stops growing its balance sheet, the, the, uh -huh. the balance sheet will kind of flatten out for a while. Not, the Fed will not immediately go to shrinking the balance sheet. I mean, okay. if you, you could think about the tapering we're going. It started that the Fed was buying $85 billion per month then 75, 65, 55, 45. Well, five, negative five, negative 15. It could just keep uh, going that way. Okay. I don't think that's what's going to happen. I think they're going to flatline it for a while. The Hawks won't be ha happy about it. And the first battle on the Fed will be over how long do you flatline this okay. before starting to shrink the balance sheet. But, but the Fed will stop the tapering even though, uh, I think you mentioned it's, it's, its core mission now uh, to keep unemployment between 5.2 and 6 yeah. percent uh, and inflation around 2 percent. Right. But as you pointed out, we're not quite we there yet. We haven't done that yet. Right. Mm -hmm. So you could, you could ask why has the Fed been tapering at all? Right. And I think the answers are, it's, a, it's not one answer, but it's a couple of pieces. One is that you, you've had a lack of buy-in from the Hawks on the FOMC from the beginning, basically. They've constantly been saying, let's get out of this, let's get out of this, let's get out of this. And Bernanke finally started moving. Well, and they didn't want to be there to begin with. They Is didn't want correct? to be there right. in the beginning with, yeah. absolutely. So Bernanke was finally starting to move in that direction. The second thing, I think, is even by the estimates that you see from the Fed, and especially by the estimates that you see by outside scholars, QE3, as opposed to QE1, the first episode of quantitative easing, was having very, very small effects on interest rates. So uh -huh. if you're sitting there and you're Ben Bernanke and you're saying, well, I might have a mutiny on my hands. On the other hand, if I give up this, which isn't doing any good anyway. Now, he never said that. Right. <laughs> uh, that's not such a terrible deal. He never said it's never doing any good anyway. But I think the evidence is that QE3 has had just very small effects on interest rates. Okay. Then the next obvious question is, so when will interest rates start rising? Did I that you is talk the next, about? Uh, so, <laughs> so the next stage in the, the next stage in the exit will be to start shrinking the Fed's balance sheet okay. before interest rates, I believe. That's certainly what the Fed has said in the past. And then sometime after that, who knows? Depends on how the economy does. Six months later, 12 months later, uh, interest rates start rising. And not rocketing. They're going to go up a lot eventually. Okay. But I think the Fed will be very careful and judicious and raise the interest rates slowly and gradually. So a judicious Fed will act slowly. Is that partly to offset any negative market yeah. reaction? Well, a little, but mainly to watch the economy. Okay. The Fed does not want to clobber the economy back down into recession again. That's the last thing it wants. Right. So it's main, yes, it will be watching the market reaction, or maybe I should say the market overreaction, <laughs> uh, but it'll be more watching the economy. 
and we've just had a very bad first quarter. I think you yeah, called terrible. it catastrophic. If uh, yes, uh, well, it's zero, which is pretty bad. Uh, yeah, it's how, zero. Yeah, that's pretty bad. And by the way, the recent data that have come in since then suggest it was actually a little negative. Uh, so when they okay. do the second print, so to speak, uh, it get, there'll be a revision. But there'll not be several upwards, revisions. Some people. Have so far, that. it looks downward. Now more okay. numbers will still come in. Maybe it'll be upward, but so far it looks downward actually. So, so this Fed, you mentioned Ben Bernanke, um, uh, Janet Yellen now uh, is chair of the Fed. Uh, what is the uh, what is the decision making like at the Fed now? Um, it, I think you're on uh, record as 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 being in favor of uh, Miss Yellen uh, oh, taking on, and and both I believe you and she and Mr. Bernanke. Uh, we're all are all in favor of a more open Fed yes. um, that speaks to the outside world and tries to do so clearly. Yes. Um, will that be an easy process, as you mentioned, for the uh, for the Fed to slowly and deliberately uh, perhaps raise the short-term rates? Uh, I think not so easy. So mm. first of all, the way you characterize Janet Yellen's and mine and Ben Bernanke's attitudes about transparency and openness at the Fed is exactly right. She's a believer. It's not going to be easy, though, because it's a committee which, when at full strength, which it hasn't been for a while now, has 19 members. Uh, and I don't want to say there are 19 different opinions, but there are a bunch. And in particular, there's this overlying hawk dove battle that's been going on for a very long time, sublimated right now, but it's going to come back. And so the problem is uh, what I call the cacophony problem. If the Fed starts speaking with 19 voices, then it's not really doing what transparency is supposed to do. Transparency is supposed to let people look into the institution. This is what the institution is likely to do. I'm in favor of that. Bernanke was in favor of that. Yellen is in favor of that. But what you don't want to do, and this is the danger, is just confuse the markets. This one says this, this like one says the opposite. Many messages, yeah. As opposed to sending a, a consensus Clear. message yeah, that yeah. has, yeah. so it's been worked out in the deliberations, but Ideally, now here's. That's what happens, okay. yes. Like in many organizations, you go behind closed, door, closed doors and you scream and yell at each other and throw things, then at the end come out and say, we're all agreed. That would be nice, but that's not what we're going to get. I don't okay. think. All right. I, I'm sorry for jumping around a bit, but it, it's um, you, you also mentioned Dodd Frank, um, and that you uh, didn't think it was perfect, but perhaps um, uh, maybe the best. Put words in your mouth. Yeah. The best we could do. Yeah. Um, most uh, most banks, most many companies within the financial services arena say it's too complicated, yep. it, it puts too much of a regulatory burden. Yep. I mean, our readers, our, our viewers are, are, tend to be small business people, these advisors, and I mean, nobody likes regulation. Sure. Um, no, you, don't expect, you don't expect the regulated to enjoy regulation. <laughs> that you right. don't expect that. Right. But, it, I mean, but what some folks say is this is holding back economic growth. It's keeping the banks and other companies from focusing on serving clients and perhaps growing their businesses yeah. uh, instead of spending money uh, to comply with with regulations, many right. of which have not even been implemented in the, the Dodd-Frank ones. Um, I mean, what's your thought about... Uh, so first of all, well, what we can do is very difficult for reasons I'll get to in just a second. But the notion that it's too complicated is undoubtedly true. The notion that there are things that are wrong with it is undoubtedly true. Why can't we fix them? It, it comes to the partisanship of Congress. In the past, every major piece of financial regulation, I'm tempted to say every piece of regulation, but I'm less knowledgeable about food safety and things like that. Mm -hmm. But basically, every piece of financial regulation, and also any, every big tax change, has been accompanied later by a technical corrections act. Congress looks back and said, oh, God, we had this uh, multi-thousand page bill. That wasn't right. That wasn't right. Part of this is a response to the industry coming in. 
was saying, you didn't really mean to do that, did you? Mm -hmm. And some of them say, consequences well, no, that, no, sure. we never meant to do that. Right. Let's fix it. The problem is that the partisanship that exists in Congress now have blocked any attempt to do even a single technical corrections act to Dodd-Frank. And if you ask the Democrats why not, they will say, first of all, the Republicans control the House. Go to the, go to the Senate where the Democrats hold it, and, and they'll say, if we try to do that, the Republicans are going to vote on repealing Dodd-Frank 42 times. And so no technical, so that's why I said it's hard to fix it. It's easy to say how to fix it. Get a Technical Corrections Act. There are probably a hundred nonpartisan things that both sides could agree on. Mm -hmm. And that helps make the law better, but we're not doing that. And one particular part of Dodd-Frank I wanted to ask you about, because I think you have some feelings about it, on, on a, having one common fiduciary standard for, uh, for people who are providing yes. uh, investment advice to yeah. individuals. And that seems to have been caught up in this partisan effort. Um, yeah, well, it's not in Dodd-Frank. That's not in Dodd-Frank. Well, OK. Um, <clears throat> well, it, it tells the SEC to, to do a study, right? right yes. Right. So um, the SEC has been told to study a few things, and they haven't acted very much on them. <laughs> right. Yes. I mean, do you, do you think that's important? I mean, I know I you do. signed the. I'm a big believer. Plan. Yes, I'm a big believer in the fiduciary standard. Now, I'm not an absolutist on anything. I can understand there'll be exceptions where it's not appropriate, but the way I like to think of it is, think of the universe of people working for all kinds of different firms, some independent, some on sell side, uh, that give financial advice. How many of them are subject to the fiduciary standard? I'd like it to be a bigger number. Okay. <clears throat> and how we get there is another issue. There are perhaps. always details, and one should pay attention in, in the details to what people in the industry who know better than anybody else are saying. Okay. Uh, but when you do that, you always have to remember what I said before, which is that the regulated never like to extend regulations. That's not because they're bad people. I wouldn't like it either. If you started regulating how to teach economics, I wouldn't like it. <laughs> I don't blame anybody for not liking it. Right, right. Uh, just two more questions. One is, Again, our viewers and, and readers are, are these uh, advisors, and one of their biggest challenges is to, is to manage expectations of mm -hmm. their clients mm -hmm. when the markets are performing poorly, but even when the markets are performing really well, like mm -hmm. they did mm -hmm. last year. Yeah. I mean, do you have any advice with your knowledge of how the economy and the markets work that you can to, to, no. to keep? <laughs> no. What I say is good luck. Yes. Keep trying to do it. But the problem, this is how we get bubbles. Uh -huh. You get a couple of years where the stock market goes up 15% a year, and pretty soon too many investors are thinking, well, it always goes up 15% a year. You've got to tell your clients it's not so. That's one. Secondly, if it's too good to be true, it's probably not true. Right? This is the Bernie Madoff principle. Right? right? That's just the worst example. Right. But you see it a lot. Thirdly, in the fixed income world, interest rates are really low. Now, they're going to go up, but they're going to remain low by historical standards for a long time. So people that are into fixed income, not everybody wants to be in the stock market. Right. People that are into fixed income need to, be, need to know and need to be told that in, we're just in a low interest rate environment if you lend to a risky enough borrower, you can get a high interest rate, but you've got to understand that you're running a lot of risk. Now, investment advisors tell their clients right. these. Right. So I, I just say, keep on telling them. And good luck. Yeah, and good luck. So you mentioned teaching economics. Are you, are you happy? What do you think about the, the next generation of economists, the students you see? Uh, will we be in good hands in terms of I'm a little a worried. Science, I'm a little worried. Uh, and the reason is that too much of what we teach in PhD level economics, these are the people that go on to become professors, Yes. Um, at Princeton and everywhere, so this is not just, I just know Princeton best, but it's everywhere, is so abstract that 
its connections to reality are often not obvious. And I worry to the extent we're teaching our graduate students that those connections are not so important. So what you have to know is the technical minutia uh -huh. and not so much the big picture issues. That, by the way, you didn't ask about this, but just to finish, yes. um, that's, I think, one of the good reasons why there's so much of a fuss over this new book by Thomas Piketty. Uh -huh. Now, that's about inequality, but it's like old-fashioned economics. It's very big picture. It's how do these ideas relate to the world? And it's almost on every page of his book. Okay. Uh, and I think that's a really good thing. I'd love to th see that as a new trend. I'm skeptical. But they, because they need to be so abstract in order to get tenure, uh, to at get the best tenure and yeah. to prove their... Yeah, it's like weightlifting. I'm going to show you I can bench press 500 pounds. So you might say, well, why would anyone ever want to bench press 500 pounds? Never mind. That, those muscles that you've... Right. And how can it help society or how can it help our understanding right. of... Right, right. Great. Well, thank you, Professor Blinder. Appreciate your time again. You are welcome. This is Jamie Green signing off. Thank you.